Welcome to Living Life. Recently, I received an email that made me troubled a little bit. This email was from my uh, old college, and it was informing me that my 20-year college reunion was just around the corner. And the email asked, do I want to go? So I was wondering, do I want to go? And there was a part of me that of course wanted to go and see people I haven't seen in such a long time. But there was also a part of me that was like, no, I don't want to go. And I was wondering, why wouldn't I want to go? So I examined my heart. And as I examined my heart, I discovered my heart was rusting with this anxiety. This anxiety of thinking, I think my friends, my former acquaintances have accumulated many successes, many prizes, many possessions. I think they've had many great victories. And I was wondering, would these people, after having had these great victories over the last 20 years, still value spending time with me? And would they still see me with affection? And would they look forward to connecting with me? And that, I think, is something that I was surprised to discover in myself. May it be that as you look in today's passage, that you might be led into an insight about what it means to trust that the victory belongs to the Lord. And may you gain wisdom about how to see other people's victories and your own in a way that is biblical. Second Samuel chapter 8 verses 1 to 18. In the course of time, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them, and he took Metheg Amma from the control of the Philistines. David also defeated the Moabites. He made them lie down on the ground and measured them off with a length of cord. Every two lengths of them were put to death, and the third length was allowed to live. So the Moabites became subject to David and brought him tribute. Moreover, David defeated Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Jobah, when he went to restore his monument at the Euphrates River. David captured a thousand of his chariots, 7,000 charioteers, and 20,000 foot soldiers. He hamstrung all but a hundred of the chariot horses. When the Arameans of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David struck down 22,000 of them. He put garrisons in the Aramean kingdom of Damascus, and the Arameans became subject to him and brought tribute. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. David took the gold shields that belonged to the officers of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. From Teba and Berothai, towns that belonged to Hadadezer, King David took a great quantity of bronze. When Tu, king of Ramah, heard that David had defeated the entire army of Hadadezer, he sent his son Joram to King David to greet him and congratulate him on his victory in battle over Hadadezer, who had been at war with Tu. Joram brought with him articles of silver, of gold, and of bronze. King David dedicated these articles to the Lord, as he had done with the silver and gold from all the nations he had subdued. Edom and Moab, the Ammonites and the Philistines, and Amalek. He also dedicated the plunder taken from Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Jobah. And David became famous after he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He put garrisons throughout Edom, and all the Edomites became subject to David. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. David reigned over all Israel, doing what was just and right for all his people. Joab, son of Jeruiah, was over the army. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilud, was recorder. Zadok, son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, son of Abiathar, were priests. Saraiah was secretary. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, 
was over the Carathites and Pelathites, and David's sons were priests. Today's passage tells us that David had great victories, victories that are so much bigger than anything you or any of our friends have done. Let's see what David did. Verse 1 tells us that David defeated the Philistines, these, this group of people that has tormented the Israelites for generations. David just drove them out, conquered them, defeated them. He also defeated the Moabites, and it goes on to list many other nations that David was able to absolutely dominate. His victory was complete over many nations. And it made me wonder, how did his victory end up changing David? And we see that David didn't change very much. It says in verse 3 that David defeated Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobah, when he went to restore his monument at the Euphrates River. And it says that he captured a thousand of his chariots, 7,000 charioteers, and 20,000 foot soldiers. And so now David, this person who used to be a fugitive, who had just no advantages, no equipment, obviously no chariots, he is able to win a military victory that allows him to access great military technology and build up his army in ways that he has never imagined before. And what does David do? It says that David hamstrung all but a hundred of the chariot horses. That means he made them unable to be used in a military way. Why would David do this? I think it's because David wanted to make sure that his confidence and his country's confidence was not in having a bunch of chariots, but having the right relationship with God. And because he knew that God was his defender, instead of keeping all of these chariots that he would have to maintain, and instead of maintaining all of these chariot horses that he would have to spend a lot of the nation's resources to continue to take care of and do the upkeep, he hamstrings them so that he can just have them be dispersed, maybe sold or maybe given to other people, all but a hundred of the chariot horses. And that tells us that David's character is very consistent. Instead of being changed in his priority and changed in his life strategy by the victory that he has, he is able to stubbornly uh, hold on to the faith in God that defined him in his earlier years. The faith in God that defines him and is the basis of his confidence when he had nothing is the same basis of his confidence even when he seems to have everything that the world values. And as a result, David's heart remains steadfast and consistent. How is it that David is able to remain unchanged despite having victory upon victory? Uh, the text tells us in verse 6, that it's because the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. It is because David firmly believed that his victory didn't come from his strategy or his daring or his skill. He believed that God was giving him the victory. As a result, instead of being changed by the possessions that he accumulated, he was able to maintain the same, same attitude and strategy for life. It goes on to tell us in the following verses all of the possessions that David accumulates. It's not just military, military equipment that he accumulates. He accumulates lots of treasure, gold and bronze and silver and many, many other treasures as well. What does David do with all these treasures? It says in verse 11 that King David dedicated these articles to the Lord as he had done with the silver and gold from all the nations he had subdued. And so what we see is that King David is able to take all of the spoils of war and say, I'm going to give this to God, not to glorify in it for myself, not to make these possessions the basis of allowing me to dominate others and be the envy of the world. Instead, I want all of these things that God has given me to go towards proclaiming God's glory. And so he is able to dedicate it all 
unto God. It also says that David enjoyed not just possessions, but he also enjoyed a great reputation. Verse 13 tells us that David became famous. He became even more famous after he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. And so on top of having great victories and accumulating much treasure, David also makes a name for himself. He's almost legendary at this point. People speak about him with awe. But he is able to maintain a heart that is simple and humble and consistent. Why? Again, verse 14 tells us it's because he firmly believed that it was the Lord who gave David victory wherever he went. Friends, maybe like me, you have the opportunity to meet up with someone that has been doing really well in life. And you're wondering, wow, oh, is that person going to be able to value my, the friendship that we used to have? Friends, I, I hope that you will assume the best about the people who have succeeded. And instead of assuming that they've become proud or that they would look down on you, that you would assume that they are able to have the faith that defined them in their past. That you're able to assume that they would be able to give the credit to God, be able to dedicate their lives towards God's glory. As a result, you would be able to look forward to believing that friendship with you would be able to be as enjoyable as always because the heart of their character, the center of their identity has never shifted over those times. Uh, we see in verse 15 that because of this consistency of thinking that God gave him the victory and because of his discipline and dedicating all things for God's glory, it says that David reigned over all Israel doing what was just and right for all of his people. He was able to be a good king because he believed that it wasn't his doing that ensured the blessings over his people because he centered his thinking about the country and his gratitude about the country on the basis of what God has done, he was able to do the just and right thing for his people. And that's demonstrated in the administrative decisions he takes in the following verses. Pretty much, instead of trying to make um, all of the different departments of the country be something that he controls, something that he can uh, manipulate for his gain, he appoints people to have authority and leadership in different areas so that they can do things efficiently for the people's sake and for God's sake. And I think that this really challenges me because it says that, or it implies, that if we really want to do what God wants, we will raise up people to have authority and power and leadership that we don't directly control anymore. And that will lead to great outcomes for the people we lead. And that will lead to God receiving the most glory. And if we're unable to let go of control, it might be because we are wanting to claim things for ourselves in a greedy, possessive way, in a way that will lead to hardship for the people we lead and also to the ruin of our character. May it be that as you consider today's text, that you'd be able to see that when others seem to be gets, getting more victory than you, you don't have to be afraid of the changes that might happen in your relationships with them, because if they give the glory to God, then the relationship you enjoyed will remain consistent. May it also challenge you in the areas of victory that you've had. Could it be that God is calling you to give more credit to God, dedicate more of your possessions towards God, and to raise up leaders so that instead of controlling everything yourself, you're able to release others to live for God as well. Friends, when we know that the victory belongs to the Lord, then we will have true confidence. Whether it's the victory of a friend or a victory in your life, these victories will be true joy and true freedom when you believe that it comes from God. Would you join me in prayer? 
God, would you help us to be people who are wise, who know that all good things come from you and that every victory is because of your blessing. God, as people of such faith, such clarity of thinking, would you make us good influences to others that we see, to those who have had defeats, setbacks, and troubles, Would you help us to not be proud, but rather encouraging as we see them, being able to testify that whatever has been better or easier in our life has not been because of our wisdom or our ability, but because of your favor and protection. Instead of gloating over others, would you help us to be truly pastoral and encouraging to them? And God, when we encounter people who have had more worldly success than us, would you help us to see them not with awe, but with brotherly and sisterly love, knowing that their blessings have also come from you. Would you help us to, by the way we treat them, be a way for them to be reminded of how to walk with simplicity and heart and humility and heart that allows us to truly rest in you. These things we pray in Christ's name.